Welcome back everyone. Today we have a very special interview. Today I am talking to Kira Buckland. Kira is the voice actress behind 2B and Near Automata. She has also voiced characters in many different video games and anime series. She was even in uh, the anime film A Silent Voice. So Kira, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to talk today. Yes, thank you for having me. Alright, so um, today we are, I was thinking we could talk mostly about your role in Near Automata as 2B. So um, I was wondering, how did you get the role? Like, did you audition for it or how did this happen? Yes, yeah, so I've worked with the specific recording studio that worked on the game for a number of years. Before that, um, I'd done other projects there with them, like Fire Emblem Heroes, Ace Attorney, um, Dead or Alive, all that kind of stuff. So when auditions for a new project come about, you know, a lot of times as actors, when we do an audition, we might not know too much about like what exactly we're auditioning for because obviously everything is still extremely confidential when it's kind of um, in development, maybe like news about it hasn't been announced yet. So a lot of the times we're just kind of, maybe we're seeing like a little character description and kind of, okay, just, you know, do your best to kind of um, do the audition for what you what you think this character would sound like. Um, so this was actually an in-person audition because this was obviously years before the coronavirus pandemic happened. And um, a lot of studios now just do remote auditions from home anyway, even before this. But um, for these particular auditions and some others with the studio, we actually did go in and audition which was really nice because then I could get like a little feedback in real time and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I just read for a couple characters and I obviously didn't really know much about what I was auditioning for at the time. And I remember when I auditioned for 2B, I was thinking like, oh, this character seems like a really cool, like strong female warrior type. Like I never book these kinds of roles, you know, because normally I played like either cute characters, bratty characters, young, energetic, like that, that kind of stuff, you know. So a character like this, it was obviously something that I always wanted to play, but I just thought like I'm never gonna book this like they're gonna give this to someone who always books these types of roles and can do it really well so um I auditioned I, I mean I still just tried to do my best and because sometimes like you audition for a project and even if you don't get the role you auditioned for they might have like smaller parts later that they bring you in for and stuff so you know I was just hoping that I'd get to be in the game somewhere and then when I had my first session scheduled um I remember they're like, okay, you got the role of 2B. And I was like, oh, is that a big part? You know, because obviously there was not really much known about the game at the time. And then I see like, you know, the opening intro where <laughs> that everything that lives is designed to end speech. And I was like, wait, so she like opens the game. Oh, wow. She's the main character. Okay. So, you know, like it was obviously a lot of pressure because I wanted to do a good job. Um, but at the same time, I didn't know when I was recording that this game was going to blow up and be super big because so many times we just, we record for a bunch of games, a bunch of shows, whatever. And it's kind of out of our hands, how it's received or how popular it gets. So it was a nice surprise. I see. So they gave you kind of like a description of the character you're going to play and like they showed you the picture of her or anything or what was it like? like yeah, yeah. When we did the actual recording session, um, we had some people from the localization team there. So they were obviously um, they were able to give a lot of context and kind of explain like, here's the world, here's the characters, here's what's going on. Um, and actually something that we did that I find really helpful that we do in a lot of these projects is we got to hear the Japanese line before each line that I recorded. Um, and most of the time, you know, it's not like we have to be 100% exact to the intonation, but hearing her performance was really helpful because, you know, obviously we don't always know what things are going to look like in the game, except when we're dubbing the cutscenes. So it just kind of helps to make sure that I'm on the right track by hearing and kind of emulating the Japanese performance. That's good. Um, so when did you find out that you got the role? Um, I don't remember exactly because a lot of things that actors do and that I also advise actors to do, especially early on in their careers, is you just got to audition and forget. So a lot of times you might be auditioning for different projects with different studios and you just do your best with the audition and then you just try to forget about it, move on to the next thing. And that way, if you get that booking, it's a really nice surprise because so many times we audition for stuff that we just never hear back on because we don't book. I see. And um, so when you got the role, what were the recording sessions like? Do you remember that at all? Or 
Yeah, I remember um, I still had a day job at the time. So um, it was a lot of just like kind of recording when I didn't have to work at my day job. Um, it's it's really funny because I think a lot of people don't always realize that just because you get a big role doesn't mean that you're going to suddenly be financially stable or being able to voice act full time because any kind of freelance job, it's more about the consistency of the work and not so much li- like did you get this big job or did you play a lead or whatever? Cause it's kind of like, well, after we're done recording for that project, we still have to, you know, have other stuff lined up. So um, I think we usually recorded between like two and four hours at a time, obviously for like the leads, like 2B, 9S, A2, we were probably doing more four hour sessions from what I remember, just because it's like um, we have a lot of dialogue to get through. And I don't know, um, I'm sure a lot of people know this, but just for anyone listening who doesn't, um, the other thing that people don't always realize is that actors don't normally record together for video games. So like all my interactions with Kyle, who played 9S, I'm not hearing what he did. You know, it's like we're not hearing each other until the game is out and we played it ourselves. I see. Yeah, that's what I've heard from a few other people I've talked to that it's mostly just you're kind of alone doing your lines. That That's kind of yeah. accurate, right? That's uh, that's interesting. So, um, how have your how's your interactions with your fans been since uh, you were in the game? Very, very cool for the most part. You know, you're always going to have some trolls and haters no matter what you do. And there's just like nothing you can really do about that. So if someone's like, oh, the English dub sucks. I'm just going to play in Japanese. I'm just like, OK, cool. Like the Japanese voices <laughs> are great, too. I hope you enjoy the game. You know, like, yeah. what are you going to do? Right. But um, I mean, overall, it's like. I think one thing that really stood out to me about just like mere fans in general is I had never received that type of love for any project that I'd ever done because um, I was actually working a lot before near like I was doing a lot of anime a lot of JRPGs that kind of stuff but people didn't really know who I was so I didn't get a lot of like fan mail fan interactions anything like that it was kind of you know it was kind of like depressing at first because even though it's not why we do it it's kind of like I would see all my friends getting like fan mail and stuff and I was like oh man I hope that one day like people like my work too and then it's like it literally takes just like that one big role and then people are like oh you've also been in other stuff that I've liked so it was like really um um, totally different to go from like a virtual nobody in the industry, despite having worked to like, like, I guess another option that I will explain it with is that um, when I did like a couple convention signings and stuff before Near Automata came out, I, I would have like nobody in my line. Like I would just be sitting there and playing on my DS or like catching Pokemon. Cause it was like, nobody knew who I was. So they wouldn't come up to get a signature. And then after Nier came out, it was like lines and it's, it was just so like, you know, kind of your imposter syndrome kicks in like, wait, what, why are they doing this for me? But it's been really cool. Like, especially the amount of love that people have shown me and Kyle and, you know, especially cause we like to interact with the fan base where we can. I can imagine that is pretty cool. So you'd say that it probably changed your career, this one role, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's great. So, um, so you also reprised the role for Soul Calibur 6 because they brought the uh, 2B into Soul Calibur as well. Uh, what was that like? That was really exciting and a super nice surprise because before it was um, revealed that 2B would be a guest character, I had already recorded the role of Talim. Now, I only play Talim in 6 um, because her original voice actress wasn't available to come back for whatever reason. So um, they were auditioning voice matches and I played a lot of Soul Calibur. Um, it was one of my first fighting games or actually, no, it was my, it was my very first fighting game. So I was pretty familiar with the game and the characters. And I think it helped me um, with my voice match audition just to like do a better job. And so I had already recorded for the role of Talim. And then later when it's like, oh, you've got another character coming back. I was, I was like really excited because I feel like had we known that 2B was going to be the guest character from the beginning, I probably wouldn't have gotten to read for anybody else. So it was like kind of just this cool coincidence that I ended up getting to play two characters. I see. That's a, that does sound pretty cool. So yeah. Um, so you, you already, you were, you start off as a fan of Soul Calibur and then you got a role in the game. That's, I thought you were really cool as well. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, are there any other games you like? Like you said that you're uh, you like games and anime, or oh, which, which uh, media are your favorite? I would ask. Um, fighting games for sure. So that was another thing that was really cool getting to be in. Like, um, I've been in five fighting games now. So, um, I was in Dead or Alive. That was the very first fighting game that I was in as Honoka, and. Then I also did Street Fighter as Falk and Soul Calibur as Talim and TB, obviously. Um, and then I was in Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle as Heart I Know from Arcana Heart. And just recently, the game's not out yet, but they announced the cast for it. I'm in Phantom Breaker Omnia as May. And I'm really excited because she's a pink haired idol and I love playing pink haired characters. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of pink haired characters. So, um, which of these uh, characters do you think is your favorite, besides Tubi? Because I'm pretty sure that's your favorite character, right? Um, of fighting games or any character? Uh, just any character, actually, yeah. Um, another character that's very special to me is Remy Sugimoto from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable, because JoJo's is my favorite show, my favorite media of all time. Um, it sounds dramatic, but JoJo's changed my life, and it's just something that it's like, I don't even know how to describe how much JoJo's has influenced me from everything to like my fashion, my music taste, my cosplay, like you name it. So just being a part of the JoJo dub, like the JoJo universe in some way, that made my life. Wow. wow. So you started off as a fan of JoJo and then you got a role in the actual dub. That, that, that's how well, it happened. I was actually already a voice actress by the time that I started getting into watching JoJo, mm -hmm. but there was no. Um, English versions like this was before they even dubbed part one or anything the time that I got into it so people didn't know like oh are they even ever gonna dub Jojo or whatever because the it took so long for the anime to come out compared to the manga which has been going since 1987 and they've been doing a really good job catching up with everything because now it's like part five is already finished um and the manga's up to part eight so it's still like a lot farther ahead but you know it's like at the time that I got into JoJo, I was like, oh, man, I'd love to be in JoJo if they ever do an English version. But you just don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, what have you been up to recently? Like what kind of uh, roles and things have you been doing in the past year? Um, so one of the projects that I was really excited about that came out not terribly long ago was called 13 Sentinels. And I played a character named Ryoko, who's kind of like a mostly soft-spoken kind of character and you know there's some story and plot reasons why she is that way obviously but um i just think it's a really cool game it's got like mechs and kaiju and um another reason that that game is kind of special to me is because it was one of the very first big projects that i recorded from home once the pandemic started and, you know, I'd recorded like indie games and stuff from home before for many years. But when it came to actual big releases that are normally always done in studio, it was, you know, a lot of pressure to record it from home because we we all didn't have a choice. You know, normally we'd be going in. But when the pandemic hit, it was kind of like, OK, we have to figure out a way to do our jobs from home. I see. So how does voicing a character from home differ from going to a studio? Like, What's the difference? Well, I think the biggest thing is that we kind of have to, I don't want to say be our own audio engineers because we still do have an audio engineer on the line who's, um, you know, doing a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to that kind of stuff. But just in terms of things that you don't really have to think about when you're in studio, like you have to kind of um, monitor your gain, like your levels. So if you're doing like a whispering line and then you're doing a shouting line and then you're going back to conversational, you have to make sure to kind of... Um, change those levels on your end because the the audio feed is only as good as what you're sending them, you know? Um, and there's also just more technical stuff to deal with. Um, for video games, it's not as bad, but for dubbing, it's really challenging because everything involves matching picture. Exactly. So with kind of lag and latency and things like that, it can sometimes be a little challenging because you know, we're working with different programs the best we can. We use something called Source Connect a lot of the times for the audio so that they can get my audio feed directly and, you know, mess around with it in Pro Tools, which is like the program that they use in studios to kind of um, record and edit the audio. And 
we're using something like Skype or Zoom for the video and it's like it works pretty well, all things considered, but, you know, sometimes it's like the the connection isn't good or, you know, just like there's too many people using those services that day and, and things get choppy. And, um, you know, and I think the other thing, too, that I know a lot of other actors are struggling with as well is that we can't really control the outside noise that happens for home recording. So if your neighbor decides to mow the lawn or like your upstairs neighbor is hammering, which literally happened to me, we had upstairs neighbors like hammering and drilling and stuff. And, you know, leaf blowers outside weather, there's so much stuff that like, you know, even if you have a good booth in your home, as I do, it's not going to be as soundproof as in the studio. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. It's a, it's a struggle, you know, all this random background noise coming in and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, so last, so the only role you've done during the pandemic has been uh, 13 Sentinels. I I played it by the way. Uh, I do recognize the character that you played as well. Um, Oh, no, I've actually I've been working from home since March, basically. So I've done a ton of stuff from home. Um, If I'm Setsuna on Yashahime, one of Sashomaru's twin daughters, and that we've been recording entirely from home as well. I did May from Phantom Breaker, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I did like the ReZero OVAs. Um, A lot of my next life is a villainous. Um, I did my Pokemon Journeys episode from home. There's just so much. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's there's been so since then you have there's been uh, going back to the uh the studios. They haven't opened them back uh, up again yet or very rarely. Um there'll be certain projects where they really need to record in studio for one reason or another, but I have um like in the past year since well since March when all this started, I've only gone to a studio 3 times total and it was all, you know, just projects where we're like we really need to do this one in person, but most of the time unless either the production super needs it for some reason or the actor requests it because they have no way to record from home at the moment, they've been trying to keep everybody home cuz Southern California um covid cases are real bad here right now unfortunately. Yeah. So, um, uh, that's interesting. So, uh, about your career, you started off doing smaller flash projects, like, um, like flash games and, uh, animations, and then you gradually worked on to doing, uh, bigger productions. How, how has that changed over the years from the beginning to where you are now? Um, I mean, I think, uh, there are a couple things for me that were really important. One of them being, um, getting acting training because, you know, just doing hobby stuff online, you're kind of playing around, you're doing stuff for fun. You're just kind of like a lot of that was self-taught and just learning from practice, which is still very valid. But I think it's also important if you have the resources to be able to take acting classes, any kind of voice coaching, you know, just learning how to be an actor is the most important part of voice acting, hands down. And pretty much anyone will tell you that. So um, just, just like slowly getting acting training was really helpful. Um, obviously you have to have good demo materials. Like you have to get a demo professionally recorded. Um, moving to LA was the biggest thing for me because, you know, now things with the pandemic and home recording, there's like a little studios are a little more open to kind of recording people remotely. If they have a good home studio, like you'll see some crossovers between LA and Dallas, but you know, it's like, especially back when I moved to LA, which was in late 2011, it's like, you had to be here, you would not even be considered for an audition. And it still is that way with a lot of studios. So I think it's, um, you know, that was the biggest thing was moving to where the work is. But I also stress to people that you should be ready before you do that. Like you should have money saved up, you should have already had some kind of credits, even if it is just things like indie games. Um, you know, just so you have some work experience, you should have your marketing materials, all that kind of stuff. All right, I see. So would you say that it's like easier to get um, voice jobs these days since you don't have to drive all the way to some studio that's over in a different state or a different city or something like that? Um, I mean, it's, in some ways, location barriers have been breaking down. Like you are seeing a little more crossover between the LA and Dallas markets, which are the two, I would say the two main markets for voice work in the US. Um, But, you know, I think in terms of getting jobs in general, it's just like the industry is so competitive and it's so saturated that I feel like it gets kind of 
Well, it's, it's kind of a toss up because, yeah, there's a lot more jobs that are available online and things like that. These days, there's a lot of opportunities for indie work, you know, just all sorts of things. But at the same time, there's thousands and thousands of people who are doing voiceover and they're, you know, even stuff that would set you apart before, like, hey, I have a broadcast quality home studio. Well, now everybody has to have one because of the pandemic. So you're competing against so, so many people for those roles that are available. Okay, so it, it hasn't changed that much, but it's, it's it's changed a little bit, is what you're saying? Or? Yeah. Okay, I see. So um, you've also voiced characters in some animated films, such as A Silent Voice, which uh, I had some people in my, my server watch uh, the other day just to kind of hear your um, role. And they, did, yeah, they, didn't, they didn't know why we were watching it, though, because I usually keep uh, all my interviews a little bit secret until they come out. So, uh, yeah, you played, like, the mean girl in that uh, movie. What, what, what was that movie like? Like, uh, how was the recording in that that different? Yeah, so I play a lot of mean girls, and normally I'm just like, yes, I love, like, any chance to play a mean girl. But I think because of the subject matter of the film, it was, like, it was a little bit hard for me in ways to play Nauka because, you know, like, bullying a deaf girl, that's... That's like horrid, you know. Yeah. Um, I was obviously bullied a lot growing up for various reasons. So, you know, normally it's kind of like therapeutic to play the bully. But in this case, it's like I just felt so bad for Shoko. I'm just like, she doesn't deserve this. Like sometimes it's almost even though, you, kn of course, you know that you're acting and you're playing a role. It can be hard to like play a role that is just cruel like that. Yeah, I can imagine. So, so, so was it hard playing that role or did you like... Um, I mean, yes and no, because, you know, again, I, I really feel like I excel at that kind of archetype, like the mean girls and the bullies. But, you know, at the same time, emotionally, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, you know, because it is like, you know, meant to make you emotional and meant to make you really think about stuff. Yeah, that's what I, that's what kind of why I understand, too. Um, so has there been any other uh, any other anime films you've done besides that one or? Yeah, um, I've done, you know, just a lot of bit parts and stuff like that here and there. I remember I was in one called In This Corner of the World. Um, I was a fairly big role in I Want to Eat Your Pancreas, which, again, sounds like a strange title, I know, but it's actually another movie that will probably make you cry. Um, just like certain anime movies that were based on like a series I did, like one of the Hunter Hunter movies, um, a Fate Grand Order movie. Um, yeah, like one of the sad things is that they don't really do theatrical show. I mean, especially not now, but even before that, they didn't really do much in the way of theatrical showings unless it was something really, really big, like a DBZ movie. So I don't know. Still, I'm like, I want to be in something that gets a theatrical release. Uh, didn't a silent voice get a theatrical release, or am I mistaken? Uh, very, very limited, from what I understand. Like just certain, um, you know, small venues showed it. Right. Oh, right. like the Blue Exorcist movie. It was kind of similar with that because I remember I went to go see the Blue Exorcist movie, but it wasn't in like a traditional theater. It was like a art house kind of thing, which was kind of cool. An art house. So it's like like a smaller theater, or yeah, sort of. It's just like a more independent kind of venue. That's cool. I wish they would uh, air more of these movies in in theaters these days. There, there's a small theater by me that does all the Ghibli movies every month. They do like one, once a month. Do you, do you have something like that or nearby you or? Um, you know, sometimes certain theaters will do special events, but again, now with the pandemic and stuff, it's just not a thing anymore because they're all closed. Yeah, they're all, it's been a while. So yeah. Um, are there any other? Uh, any, like favorite roles you have besides the ones we've talked about um yeah like i really enjoy every time i get to come back for an erica skin on fire emblem heroes um i there's just like so many i really liked playing mary and kakegurui um of course i'm having a lot of fun with setsuna and yashahime she's a challenging role just because it's such a different archetype than what i normally play so i you know, I hope I'm doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, like, it's it's hard to think of. Um, the Danganronpa characters were really fun. Um, of course, I was excited to be an Ace Attorney because I played that game a lot. <laughs> you, you played Trucy in Ace Attorney. What was that like? How, um, how did that happen? 
Um, just same thing where I auditioned for it. And, you know, of course, like I knew what it was when I auditioned for it because I I had played and beaten all the Ace Attorney games. So it's just like, oh, gosh, you know, like trying really hard to, um, to, to just them. do a good job, but to not get so not to get too obsessed with like, oh, man, I really want this role. Because, again, like you can't get too attached because what if you don't book it? So, um, you know, just trying to do the best I could. And then I was so excited when I found out that I was cast. Um, but, you know, that was very short because there was so like there's a ton of text dialogue in the game. So she's very prevalent in the text dialogue, but there's very little voice dialogue. So it was just like a few, I feel like the session was probably like 30 minutes or something, you know. Right. So this was um, the the 3DS Ace Attorney that you played her in. Um, yeah. And it was just like little, little voice clips here and there. It wasn't a lot of uh, long dialogue or anything like that. Yeah, it was just the cutscenes, basically. Okay. Yeah, that's that's still a great, a great a great role though. Yeah, we're all big fans of the Ace Attorney. Um, nice. My friends are also really big fans of Dongan Rampa, and um, you voiced two characters in that. You voiced uh, Hiyoko Sayonji and Kurumi Tojo. Uh, <laughs> is there anything interesting about that those roles and voicing those characters that you'd like to talk about? Or yeah, um, I was also familiar with the Dongan Rampa <laughs> franchise too. When I or actually no, I didn't even have to audition for. Kyoko, I remember I just got an email one day because it's it's kind of like most of the time we have to audition, but sometimes if it's like a studio or a casting director you've worked with a lot, they'll say like, hey, we want to offer you this role based on, you know, your previous work with us, your previous samples, auditions, whatever. So that was really, really cool. And that's such a nice surprise because it's just like, wait, it's like a present. I, I'm being offered a part in this cool thing. So, you know. That was really exciting. Again, I feel like the kind of bratty characters is something that's really in my my wheelhouse. So she was a lot of fun. And then the cool thing with Kirumi Tojo is that she was just completely different. Because, um, you know, I know that whenever it, the same voice actor plays multiple characters in the same franchise, even like different games or installments in it, people are always going to compare and be like, oh, do they sound different enough? Um, but I feel like those are pretty different. Yeah, I had no idea that you did both of them. I thought it was just uh, Hiyoko at first, but then I found out that you did Kurumi also. And uh, yeah. yeah, they're very different. Uh, Kurumi's kind of like, she's a little bit like 2B, like her, like her style and her voice a little bit. Uh, have you noticed that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually seen crossover art that people made, and um, it's like, ha, same English voice actress. Yeah, it's funny. All right, so um, so you said that your favorite video games, and so, wait, did you tell me what your favorite video game was? Because you said that you like fighting games. Uh, which one was it again? Yeah, I mean, I, I like fighting games, of course. I like um, the Guilty Gear series. I like a lot of 2D fighters in general. I don't have as much time to play fighting games as I used to, but... Um, you know, whenever I do get the chance to play them, I enjoy it. Um, I also just play Pokemon Go nonstop. I am currently level 41 on my way to level 42. And I'm a little obsessed. Like, I've been playing since 2016. I see. So you that, that's, like, your favorite game right now? or? Um, I mean, it's hard to, like, say favorite anything. But it's it's something that I really enjoy. I, can, I see. I see. And your favorite anime is JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what are your favorite movies? Do you like movies at all? or? Um, I don't really get a chance to see movies very often, unfortunately. I would say my favorite movie of all time is Labyrinth, but I'm biased because I am obsessed with David Bowie. Oh, you like David Bowie a lot? How has he influenced you? Oh, wow. Um, how hasn't he influenced me? He's just like, he was amazing. Um, I love his music. I love his style. I love how he was just so unique and trendsetting and did whatever he wanted and didn't care what other people thought. And he wasn't afraid to be like a little weird or eccentric. Um, you know, on a superficial level, he's ridiculously attractive. I'm not going to lie there. Um, and he just kept reinventing himself as a creative. And I think that was so cool. And in addition to that, like, he wasn't just a rock star or a great musician. He was an artist. He loved to read. He was incredibly smart. He even invented his own ISP at one point called Bowie Net. Um, he was just like, he did everything and he wanted to learn about everything. And it was so cool. 
That's great. So, so he's like one of your uh, biggest influences in your life, you would say, or? Yes, absolutely. Interesting. So is there anybody else you would say that uh, influenced you a lot? Yeah, um, lots of them, obviously. Um, Gwen Stefani, Billy Joe Armstrong, uh, basically like a lot of musicians. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So uh, a lot of so music is very important to you, you'd say? Yeah, I used to want to be a rock singer before I kind of discovered voice acting. And I wasn't very good at it. So obviously that didn't go anywhere. But, you know. Really? So were you like in any bands or anything? Or No, I wanted to be. I mean, I was a teenager. So okay. it was kind of like, I want to be in a band with somebody. And, you know, it's everybody has vocalists already if you're a drummer then you can find plenty of bands to be a part of oh really because uh there's like a shortage of drummers or something like that or yeah i, I felt like that because you know it's it's easier to get something like a guitar and you know kind of practice that but getting a drum set it's like it's going to be loud if you practice it it takes up a lot of space it's expensive um i don't know so i feel like that was always the hardest member of any band to find yeah, I, I can imagine. I play the drums actually a little bit here and there, but it's uh, just a little thing that I do. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I had this teacher that I used to go to, and uh, I kind of stopped since uh, you know this whole thing started and everything, but uh, hopefully I can resume it soon. Um, so, let's see. Uh, do you usually play the video games that you voice in? Like, Is that like a thing you typically do? It depends. Um, if the game itself is something that's really interesting to me, um, obviously, like I've played the fighting games that I'm in. Um, of course, I played Nier because that's just, you know, that's a whole experience. How can you not play that? Mm -hmm. um, I played like a lot of the 3DS games that I was in, like Ace Attorney, Detective Pikachu, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, obviously, I, I haven't been able to play everything because the biggest thing is just like, most people don't have the time to do all that. Um, games are also very expensive. Most of the time, voice actors don't get a free copy of the games that they were in. So we have to kind of buy or pre-order those ourselves. And it just, like, it really adds up. Um, and, you know, sometimes if it's a game that I don't think I'd be very good at, then kind of like, eh. <laughs> what games are you not good at, would you say? Um, I just don't feel like I'm good at like a lot of RPGs and stuff. And I do so many JRPGs, but I'm like, I feel like I, I wouldn't know what I'm doing. Oh, really? You, so you're not a big RPG fan? Um, I wouldn't say it's that I'm not a fan. It's just that I never really, I guess, like sat down and tried to learn the mechanics to where I wouldn't die constantly. <laughs> yeah, they take a lot of getting used to these kind of games. So and I think also it's just like daunting to put so many hours into a game sometimes like, you know, if it's a game I'm super invested in, like, um, I, I really enjoy like the Legend of Zelda games, for example. So I will put a bunch of hours into those. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, which Zelda game is your favorite? Ocarina of Time. I know that's a really <laughs> generic answer, but there's a reason that it's so many people's favorite. I see. So. Uh, so wait, uh, Ocarina of Time, is there any... Uh, are there any other like games, like non-fighting games, that you're a big fan of besides that one? Um, I've played all the Pokemon games. I really enjoy like you know the main mainline Pokemon games as well. That's cool. Um, I I was playing Animal Crossing for quite a while when the newest one came out, but I kind of fell off the wagon for that because everyone I know stopped playing it. Um, but I, I did put like a ton of hours into that when I played it. I see. So, how many how many hours would you say? Did you like have a good estimate or? Oh, I don't even remember. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people I know were really obsessed with that when that came out. Also. Yeah, it kind of came out at the perfect time, you know. Yeah, right when the pandemic started, and then this comes out, and then everyone's all into that. So, um, are there any future roles uh, that you can talk about that fans should keep an eye out for? Um. I'm trying to think if there's anything recent that's been announced. I feel like, um, I mean, obviously new episodes of the Yashihime dub are being released pretty much every week. You can watch it on Crunchyroll. Um, I think it's available on a couple other sites as well, like maybe Hulu. Um, Phantom Breaker should be coming out pretty soon. That's another fighting game I mentioned that I'm pretty excited about. And I can't think if there's anything like super recent that i can talk about aside from those 
Yeah. Um, a new Katarina skin just came out in Fire Emblem Heroes, so that was exciting because it was the first time she got like another skin besides her base one. So do you do new? You do, you do like new voice lines for those characters when they get a new skin, or what happens? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So uh, you voiced uh, characters of Fire Emblem Heroes. Uh, did you do any other Fire Emblem games, or just Heroes? No, just Heroes. I'd love to be in a base, like a main series Fire Emblem game someday. But that, that would be cool. Yeah. So um. All right, well, I think that uh, this wraps up the interview so far. We talked a lot about your career and your roles, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah, so um, everyone, make sure you check out Kira's social medias. I link them down below in the description. You can check her out on Twitter, her official website, and her store envy page. So uh, be sure to support her. Thank you so much. Yep, so uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this interview, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.